I'm Scott Wilcox, the director of South Bay Southwest Deco and the director of technology for South Bay Southwest LLC. Hope everyone is enjoying the program so far. All right. If you could not be here with us this morning, uh, before hearing from our keynotes, we're going to show you a short piece from Conservation International's Nature is Speaking film series, which is premiering here at South Bay Southwest Deco. Voiced by Edward Norton, here is The Soil. I am the soil. I am in the hills and in the valleys, the farms, the orchards. Without me, humans could not exist. But you treat me like dirt. Do you realize that I am just a thin skin on this planet? And that I'm actually alive? Full of organisms that grow your food? But I am broken, aching, overused, sick because of you. You have withered me away to less than half of what I used to be just over 100 years ago. Are you paying attention? I am turning to dust. So maybe you could treat me with a little more respect. I suppose you still want to eat, right? Okay, now we're gonna hear about some amazing science and engineering. The progress being made toward the development of sustainable jet fuel, which reduces carbon emissions by 50 to 80% compared to petroleum-based fuel through its life cycle. Our speakers this afternoon will address breakthrough research at the Sustainable Bioenergy Research Consortium in the United Arab Emirates on the use of halophytes, desert plants that can be irrigated with seawater as a biofuel feedstock, enabling local food security, socioeconomic development, and responsible use of land and fresh water. CBRC's research has positive implications for the potential production of sustainable bioenergy crops in coastal deserts in several countries. He is the managing director, uh, he is the director of CBRC at the Mazdar Institute of Science and Technology, and she's the managing director of environmental strategy for Boeing Commercial Airlines. Please give a warm welcome to Alejandro Rios and Julie Felgar. Wow, thank you very much for having us here today. We were really excited um, to be able to come to this conference. And I have to say that almost anybody that I know who's under the age of 35, as soon as I told them I was coming down here to speak, just got this really excited look on their face. This organization has done such a great job over the years. The reason that um, I believe they asked us to come was we made some announcements at the beginning of the year, and Alejandro is going to cover those uh, that relate to the use of biofuels and some projects that we have going on in the UAE. Before we introduce Alejandro to the stage, though, what I'm going to spend the next 15 or so minutes doing is pr basically providing you a scene setter. You might wonder, why is the Boeing Company here at the South by Southwest Eco Conference? Doesn't seem to quite fit. But actually, we have a very strong environmental strategy. And one of those pillars, as you're going to see, is related to biofuels. And um, I'm really excited to share that with you today. So we're going to talk a little bit about innovation and the marketplace today, and really the global rebalancing of the marketplace. And then we'll talk about our environmental strategy, biofuels, and then um, we'll go to Alejandro. And I have to say, I think I have one of the best jobs in corporate America. It's really exciting what we're doing and the potential for the future. The slide that you see in front of you right now is one of my favorite slides. What it really does is show the change in the aviation industry, which is basically underpinned by innov in innovation. 
Um, we keep innovation in mind when I start to talk about what we're doing um, in the future, because it's not all related to airplanes and uh, engineering. It's also related to the auxiliary pieces on the side of the airplanes as well. So this chart, what it basically represents is from 1939 to 2006, what it took to get from London to Sydney. And as you can see, the, um, it's certainly a much more comfortable experience today. We started off with a flying boat, 32 stops, 15 uh, passengers. It took them 10 days to get there. To the 707-320, six stops, 141 passengers, 1.5 days. And then to the 747-400, one stop, 400 passengers. To 2006, when we introduced the 777-200LR, and it only took um, one, uh, one flight, 240 passengers, 19 and a half hours. That's still a long 19 and a half hours, but it sure is better than uh, 32 stops in 10 days. Um, so what we're doing really through aviation and, and why I love to work in this industry is it's really a drawing together of cultures. It's a drawing together of stakeholders around the world. And it has, over the decades, um, really helped promote uh, the trade between nations as well as people coming together with a more global mindset. So let's look and see where our market is today. Um, aviation is expanding around the globe. Um, globalization has really reshaped that marketplace over the years. Uh, I believe that um, this is largely driven by the economic growth and certainly by the growth of the middle class um, in the emerging <coughs> economies today and markets. Um, what you see on the chart is that in 1993, bear in mind this is not too long ago, in 1993, 73% of the air traffic happened in North America and Europe. Just you know, 20 years later, that number had dropped to 50%. And um, what you see underpinning this is really the growth that's coming out of the Asia Pacific market, particularly China and the Middle East, where Alejandro is located today. So you see this global rebalancing happen. A lot of the um, growth in Asia is really driven by low cost carriers on planes like the 737 um, going forward. So really, what does this mean for aircraft demand? And these numbers are a little bit mind boggling, right? So airlines are gonna need nearly 36 1,800 new airplanes in the next 20 years. And those, that's valued at $5.2 trillion. Now, every year Boeing, Airbus, FAA, other organizations do what we call like a market outlook. We call ours the current market outlook, and these are the numbers that you're seeing right here. They take into account a number of factors, including population growth, economic growth, regulatory issues, geopolitical, geopolitical issues, what have you. We, we relook at it every year. Typically, Boeing, by the way, has been conservative, and the growth has actually been greater than what we have put out there um, in the future. Again, what this chart shows you is most of that growth is happening in the single aisle market. That's a 737 uh, size, A320 size market. And most of it, again, is happening uh, in Asia. Of this, just to put it in reference for you, around 19,000 airplanes are flying in the sky today, give or take, 19,000. So within 20 years, we're almost doubling the worldwide fleet. 60% of that is brand new growth, 40% is replacement of older airplanes, replacing them with more efficient airplanes going forward. So from a manufacturer's perspective, from a shareholder's perspective, this is a wonderful thing, right? This is a, an enormous market, it's growing like gangbusters, we're hitting record sales, we're hitting record deliveries, our skyline, that's the number of bookings we have into the future, looks really solid at this point. But it also comes with a heightened responsibility for us. And, um, it comes with some uh, potentially troubling environmental impacts if we don't take action and take action now. So let's take a look and see um, where we are. Actually, I'm gonna flip off this for a second if I can do it. I, for those of you who didn't see the chart, how much do you think um, aviation is responsible for CO2 emissions annually? Anybody willing to hazard a guess, throw out a number? How much? You saw the chart. <laughs> Most people would answer around 20% or 30%, because uh, aviation, we are growing so much, and it's a very visible industry, actually. The truth is, today, we're at around 2% um, of global industry. So um, this is from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. This was their Mobility 2030 project that they put in. 2% um, is relatively a small number, uh, but it's clearly growing, and you just saw the numbers that I just posted in front of you. And so we, we project that we would get to around 3% by 2030. You might wonder why, if we're doubling, that our numbers are not doubling. Remember, we're putting more efficient airplanes into the sky, and other industries are, are growing at the same time. So as a, as a percentage, we, we've kept to 3%. Um, 
considering aviation and aerospace in general represents around 5% of the worldwide economy, you might think that's not such a bad equation. However, in our minds, it's not acceptable. And when I say our minds, not just the Boeing company, but really the global aviation industry. Uh, you know, in terms of what we think about, Boeing looks at um, the environment as environmental stewardship strengthens our business. Um, we recognize climate change is a very real thing. We recognize that it's our responsibility to help mitigate um, effects on, on climate change. And so we have strived to improve our environmental performance as it relates to our manufacturing operations, as it relates to our products that we're putting out, and as it relates to the services that we're doing as well. For instance, in our manufacturing facilities, we're going for zero waste to landfill. We're going for zero growth in water use. Um, we're using solar uh, power wherever we can use solar power to decrease energy usage. At the same time, we're striving to um, put out the most efficient products that we can in the future, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And this is driven largely, quite frankly, by our employees, the communities that they live in and that we work in, as well as our customers who are demanding more efficient aircraft and want to meet their environmental obligations and responsibilities as well. So um, we, we really recognize that taking a positive action on our environmental footprint is actually something that's going to strengthen our business down the road. And it's not something that is, is getting in our way or we have to do this because the governments tell us we have to do it or we have to do it because the media tells us. We want to do it. We're very focused on doing it going forward. So what did we do? As an industry, in starting in around 2006, but these numbers came out in 2008, we got together and we started to say, OK, this 2% number is not acceptable. We certainly don't want to grow it. So what can we do? And uh, in starting out that strategy, we had to look and see, uh, set some aggressive targets for ourselves. So what we did was we recognized that uh, right now we get around 1% per year fuel efficiency from our products, You know, a gain in fuel efficiency. Um, but by 2020, we want to be carbon neutral growth. So that means if you, if you think back to those charts on all that growth that we're doing, we want to make sure that as we're putting those 36,800 airplanes into the marketplace, the carbon emissions don't grow at all by the year 2020. By 2050, we'd like to, off of a 2005 base, uh, baseline, reduce that by 50%. So take the number that was at 2005 and reduce that by another 50%. Um, how are we going to do that? So we have a strategy uh, for reducing these emissions. We call it our wedge chart, it's a famous wedge chart. Um, and what it really outlines is that we can do as much as we can do to create the most efficient airplanes possible. For those of you who've heard about the 787, that is a composite uh, frame, which means that it's much lighter than uh, previous generations of aircraft, which means that it's around 20% more fuel efficient. The wing design certainly helps the aerodynamics, and we have the best-in-class engines on those airplanes. So that's just an example of what we're doing. Um, the other things that you can think, I don't know if you've been on the airplanes where you see the little winglets at the end. I think Southwest has a commercial, they call it the thingamajigs, or the thingamajiggies. Those actually take around two to three to 4% sometimes off of um, uh, fuel use, off of each individual flight, which obviously translates to carbon emissions reduction as well. So that's what we're doing in our product development. Again, we're at around 1.5% a year there. The other one is more efficient flight. And what that relates to is think about when you turn an airplane on at the gate and you fly it off, you taxi off to the runway, you take off, you're flying up in the sky, then you come back down and land. That's all in the operation of the aircraft. So we're doing um, things like retrofitting aircraft with winglets. We're um, looking at optimizing air traffic management systems around the world and going to satellite-based navigation systems. We're coming up with software that, op that takes a pilot and, and helps him optimally fly that aircraft every single minute of the um, flight that he's on. But really, the, the key part and where the biggest change is going to occur is if we can create a sustainable biofuels industry going forward. So um, what does that really mean? If we change the fuel, um, you know, we've got the efficient airplanes, we've got a, our operational efficiency. If we change the fuel, we can lower our emissions by up to 50 to 80 percent, as Scott mentioned at the beginning of the um, at the beginning of the presentation. And uh, we're working through um, this. And in the meantime, that red bar there in, in introduces a concept that's, that are called market-based measures. We as an industry have gotten together and said, we will create a global market-based measure 
while it, while it takes time for technology to catch up, where we will basically pay offsets um, for air flight going forward. So that would relate mostly to the airlines uh, paying some type of, you know, you can call it like a carbon tax um, going forward. But that's really a short-term measure to help us bridge that gap until we can catch technology up, because it's pretty hard to start a new industry. Not only do we want to um, go ahead and develop this new industry because it's good for the environment, but there's other reasons too, quite frankly. One is uh, fuel has doubled as a percentage of airline costs over the past decade. So you see back in 2003, it was around 75% to today where it's around 50% of some airlines operating costs, which is enormous. And that would be one thing, but it's really hard to set a business plan in place when the volatility of the prices, you just can't predict it. So you might swing from 50% one day to 35% another, to three weeks later, you're up at, at, at some points, back in 2008, it was up to 85% for some airlines. So you can see there's a real pull from our customers as well. So liquid fuels. Um, liquid fuels are really the only realistic option for commercial aviation going forward. We've looked at solar, we've looked at hybrid technologies, batteries, we've even looked at natural gas, but none of them actually provide the benefits that um, we need. We need a high, ener high energy density for thrust of the aircraft. We need um, to be able to fly regardless of what the weather is out. We can't alter the infrastructure of the airplanes or the airports. So it really takes away all options except for um, sustainable aviation, biofuels, and liquid fuels. We have no choice. Cars have a choice. Airplanes don't. So um, where we are today, so aviation needs a drop-in biofuel. To explain that, that basically means with no changes to the infrastructure, Today, we need to be able to take the fuel and literally just mix it with the Jet A that's available on the market today. So we're looking for new ways to make the same fuels, blending it directly with the petroleum jet fuel. We'd like it to meet or exceed petroleum standards. And actually, I'll, I'll tell you, we've had some really great success with that going forward with no changes. Underpinning all of that is sustainability. When we first started on this road, we really took a hard look at first generation biofuels and said, okay, what can we learn from them because they didn't do such a great job. And what we realized is that we needed to make sure that we had sustainability principles out front. We started working with the round table on sustainable biofuels um, up front. So we're looking for strict criteria. Basically, you need net emissions reduction, no adverse impact to food, to fresh water, to land resources, and a positive socioeconomic benefit on top of that. And then we needed all the airlines to get with us um, behind that at the beginning. Um, a great example of this actually is a, a project we have in South Africa right now where we've taken hybrid tobacco that has no nicotine in it. And um, the worldwide demand for tobacco is dropping, but there's a lot of farmers out there that rely on that as their, their income source, and, and they have talent in growing tobacco. So you can take this hybrid tobacco, use it in their fields, and they know how to grow it really well. And then you can take that tobacco, and you can take the oil seeds from that tobacco, and you can transform it into um, sustainable aviation biofuels. And so it meets all those criteria going on. That's the type of thing that we're looking at. So our, our, our basic Boeing biofuel strategy is we want to expand the biofuel supply to 1% of jet fuel demand by 2016. We're on track to do this with um, green diesel, actually. We have found that you can use green diesel in aircraft uh, without any change, and you just need to change some of the fuels approval standards that we put up. We're developing it based on sustainability principles. We are around the world supporting R&D on feedstock and refining technologies, and Alejandro is going to talk a little bit about one of those projects. We're collaborating on action plans in key regions, and we're advocating for support of government policies at the same time. Um, as you can imagine, it's, it's not that easy going against the big fuel companies and trying to introduce a brand new type of fuel um, there. And the thing is, is that you can't do any one of these in a silo. You actually have to work them all together to catalyze a brand new industry. Um, you know, what are we, Boeing, good at? We're not a fuel producer. We're probably never going to be a fuel producer in my lifetime, but we are a fantastic systems integrator. That's what we do. We take millions of parts. It takes, you know, when a 777 takes off, it has something like a million parts on it. We know how to put things together. We know how to use multi-stakeholder groups, work together to develop a system, and that's what our role is um, going forward. The other thing that we're really good at is we know what fuels work in our airplanes and work with the engines in the airplanes, so we're very active in the fuels approval process uh, going forward. So where are we today in the status of the aviation biofuel industry? It's technically viable. We started down this road in 2008. Um, we've had three types of fuel um, approved by ASTM. 
They're of a very high quality standard. In fact, most of the fuels have a higher energy density than Jet A because they're much cleaner fuel, so you can actually fly further on the same gallon of fuel than you could on Jet A. Um, there's uh, very clear demand for it. We have around 33% of um, aviation fuel users in the world in a group called SAFIG, Sustainable Aviation Fuel Users Group, and they are projecting demand. These are big airlines out there that are saying, hey, if you can make it, we're going to buy it. We would prefer to buy that than Jet A. So the demand is out there. We've had more than 1,500 commercial flights. And by the way, the military is highly interested because they look at it from a national security perspective as well as from an environment perspective as well. So the Defense um, Production Assistance Act uh, just went through as well, and that is helping to set up some biofuels uh, supply chains here in the United States. The problem is the supply. We go back to this old, old uh, supply and demand side. So the refining capacity right now is very small. They're still playing a price premium, and we have a limited sustainable uh, feedstock at this point. So really, where are we? What's going to come first? Is it the old chicken and the egg, right? Is it the increased supply, or is it the lower price? that we're going to um, be hit with. And just to put it in perspective for you, we did a study in 2012 that basically said that airlines are willing to pay or can pay without affecting their profit margins, which, by the way, are you pretty razor thin, 10 cents more per gallon for biofuels. The very first flight that we did was $30, $30 a gallon of biofuels. Now, we've really come down the price curve on that so today. We're in the d double digits, and the green diesel with the incentives and the RINs that are in place will probably get us to price parity with Jet A. But that is our challenge, really, is bringing that down to where the, uh, where the airlines can go ahead and buy it. So long-term trends are pointing in the favors of biofuel. Oil prices are sustained high right now. You know, they fluctuate a little bit up and down, but we don't expect them to come down very much from where they are. Um, emissions costs are certainly not going down. They're going up, if anything. And the biofuel technology costs over the long run are actually coming down. So let's get a bit more specific. So feedstocks. I've talked about feedstocks of biofuel. Well, there's a lot. Actually, there's oils, like used cooking oil, inedible corn oil, um, jatropha halophytes, the tobacco that I mentioned. There's biomass, like ag residues, you know, sugarcane cutting, switchgrass, farm trees, halophytes. Tobacco also fit into the biomass side. There's plant sugars, like sugar canes and sugar beets. And then there's others, um, like LG municipal waste, municipal solid waste, and waste gases from factories and production facilities as well. So obviously, there's a lot of um, different biofuels. and all of that is regionally diverse around the world, right? You want to develop a regional solution for you. Um, on the fuels approval, uh, the fuels approvals will expand shortly. We've had three approved, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Near-term approvals in the next 12 to 18 months will be green diesel, alcohol to jet, hydro-treated depolymerized cellulosic, and then we have some longer-term solutions in play as well. And what's interesting is actually some of those longer-term solutions are probably where those techno-economic costs are really going to slide down the curve and help us out here. We're just getting through the kinks of the technology. And by the way, this isn't Boeing. These are all these other companies on the side here who are working hard at doing this. We're just supporting them through the fuels approval process and trying to make all the introductions that we possibly can. So biofuels, it has to be global. We can't do this just in the United States. So what we've done is an all of above um, uh, approach, really, and we've developed partnerships around the world. Just um, I'll point out a couple as an example. In Brazil, um, we have the Brazilian Biojet fuel platform. Um, they are looking at a fuel right now that's based off of uh, sugar, sugar cane residues, as well as potentially some green diesel in the future. I've, we've partnered with our, our competitor, Embraer, actually. We've partnered with Airbus, too, by the way. This is, this is something global. We all have to work it together. South Africa, I mentioned to you. In China, we're using used gutter oil because they tend to dump the oil, the cooking oil, out into the gutters, and then it rolls down. Um, so they're collecting all of that, and we're working with Comac, our Chinese competitor, on transforming that gutter oil into fuel going forward. And then last but not least, we've got Biojet Abu Dhabi with Etihad Airways and the Mazdar Institute. And with that, I'd like to invite Alejandro up, and I hope that that was a good general scene setter for you, and, and he'll take you away into a really interesting project.
Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Julie, for a good introduction. I'm gonna tell you the story of what we're trying to do at the Mazdar Institute of Science and Technology. And like the title of the presentation says, we're actually trying to produce biofuel uh, using desert land and using uh, abundant resources in the Arabian Peninsula region. Um, first, I'll give a brief introduction of what the SBRC is. The Sustainable Bioenergy Research Consortium was established by the Mazdar Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, it got together with uh, Etihad Airways, the national airline of the UAE, and one of the airlines that is fastest growing in the world. Um, obviously, the Boeing Company, uh, a company called United Oil Products. They are a refining technology company here, a, a Honeywell company and a French European conglomerate called Safran, uh, and they, among other things, they do uh, aircraft engines. So these five partners got together, they established the Sustainable Bioenergy Research Consortium. To do what? Well, um, to do research on how to produce biomass in a sustainable way. And there's a lot of research into biomass or bioenergy around the world, and the United States is actually the world leader in this particular area. In the US, the Department of Energy has been investing over the last seven years uh, significant amounts of money to uh, do research into bioenergy. How do we produce feedstocks? How do we produce biomass that can uh, be used to produce uh, fuels and other, other types of energy? If we look at the biomass supply chain, we need, to, we need for it to conform with three basic, um, I guess, characteristics. One of them is that it has to be cost effective. Julie talked about price. One of the biggest problems for airlines and for the, the energy market in general is that if we take a biomass and try to produce a fuel with it, with the costs that are currently in the market, it, it's actually not competitive. She mentioned that we have come a long way from you know, 30 times the price of, of a fossil-based alternative to around two or three times the cost of a, of a fossil-based alternative today. Well, in order for us to reach cost parity or comparison, we have to do scalability. The main problem with biofuels is that whenever we try to scale them up, we start running into a lot of the different issues that first-generation biofuels actually ran into, meaning this food versus fuel debate, which is pervasive for the corn ethanol and the, and the biodiesels, um, because you're always gonna be using land or water that can be used to grow human food. So you're always going to be facing an issue of scalability. And of course, we're gonna be facing an issue of sustainability. We have to be able to produce biomass in a way that can grow sustainably and that we can you know, we can use it actually in a renewable uh, market. In the UAE, a lot of the projects that we talk about are always faced with this stress nexus that some people are calling it. When you talk about food, when you talk about energy, when you talk about water, you're always going to be talking about the other two elements in that equation. These are three dimensions that are inextricably linked. And so in the UAE, even more so, because there's actually no fresh water, there's, or there's very little fresh water. Most of the water that is used in the UAE is actually desalinized. And so to de desalinize water, you need to invest a lot of energy. So if we think about the availability of energy, burning of fossil fuels to produce water, to produce food, it, it starts getting to very complicated issues. And so any project that is really considered when, when, when developing uh, energy, energy projects in the UAE has to consider these three dimensions. And of course, we believe that research is a driver of this sustainability. Um, as I mentioned, the US is, in, is investing approximately $100 million per year into bioenergy research. But the problem with that specific research is that it's focusing on feedstocks that actually grow with fresh water and that grow in, at best, marginal land. Most of it grows in arable land. And so when you combine those two things, you get into a, a very big problem because you're not gonna be able to move away from the indirect land use changes issues with the food versus fuel issues and all of these things. 
So why is the research that we're conducting at the SBRC important? Well, um, as Julie mentioned, one thing that most of us know, but we really don't think about, is that 97% of the world's water is in the oceans. Of the 3% that is fresh water, two-thirds is frozen. It's in either in the poles or in the glaciers. Of the 1% that is, I guess, easily or accessible for, for everything that we do, two-thirds of that is actually underground. So it's hard to reach. So only 0.3% of the world's water is surface water. It can be used for all of the different uses that we do. So if we're going to do biomass and we're going to try to grow biomass, we need to consider that other side of the fence. We need to consider what are ample resources, and one of them, or the one, is actually seawater. And one other thing is that about 20% of the world's landmass, or about 25.5 million square kilometers of land, are actually deserts or arid regions in the world. And as we saw in the video at the beginning of the session, that's only getting worse. It's actually growing. And so all of those pictures that we saw are, is land that is actually becoming too salinized to grow food or to, to do anything else with it. And so it's in our best interest to start doing research into how to grow biomass using these two resources, salt water and saline soils or, or you know, desert land. So we're actually looking at two very specific feedstocks. Uh, one of them is called it's a halophyte. Both, are, well, both of these are halophyte plants. But one of them is called salicornia. Salicornia is a plant that produces a, a long fruit, which is very, it looks very much like an asparagus, a thin asparagus. And it's a green succulent fruit. And so inside that fruit, it contains small seeds that are very similar to sesame seeds, the, one, the ones we eat with sushi. And so those seeds usually have about 30% oil content. And so the idea, or the original idea, was to produce salicornia, take the seeds out, use that oil, refine it in a very similar way we do with petroleum or crude oil, and obtain a synthetic paraffinic kerosene or an alternative to jet fuel. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at at Massar is that it turns out that in a hectare of salicornia today, with no you know, today, what, by, by, what I mean by today is that the plant is, a, is actually a wild plant. And so a hectare of salicornia in the wild today, if we would plant it in a certain way, would, uh, would give us approximately about two tons of seed per hectare. That is actually already comparable to soy, comparable to, to many other types of, of oil seeds. But it also gives you about 18 tons of biomass. And so most of the second generation or lignocellulosic research that has been going on, and that's actually a lot of what the uh, Department of Energy, uh, Bioenergy Research Center have been doing, this lignocellulosic research to be able to use the sugars in the plants for the production of energy. The other um, plant that we're looking at are the mangroves. Mangroves are one of the most efficient trees to to capture carbon from the atmosphere because they have a very extensive root structure. And so they are extremely good at absorbing carbon and putting it back into the soil. So these are our main focus. And the way we're trying to do this is with a system we call the Integrated Seawater Energy and Agriculture System. The idea here is to use seawater, bring it inland or pump it inland to feed or to irrigate a series of aquaculture ponds. The aquaculture ponds will be growing fish or shrimp. While the fish and shrimp grow, they generate a lot of waste. That waste goes into the water, and so that nutrient-rich water needs to go somewhere. Most of the time, the aquaculture industry, what it does, what they do is they just put that water back out into the ocean, creating a lot of environmental problems, eutrophication, algae blooms, many, many different uh, problems. So instead of putting the water back out into the ocean as is after the aquaculture, what we do is that we use that water to irrigate a plantation of these salicornia plants. What happens is that the, the, the nutrients in the water act as a fertilizer for the plants, and so it, it helps them grow. And so after the water comes out of the salicornia plantation, it is derived into these bands of mangrove forests, 
And I'm calling them forests because the idea is to administer or operate these forests, same as the, the paper and pulp industry do, what was, which is that they take a, a track of forests, they cut it down one year, then next year they move to a next track of forest and they replant the first one. Well, it's a silviculture scheme, and what we would be basically doing is managing the mangroves. These are cultivated mangroves. They're not mangroves that are, that are actually there right now. They're, they would be mangroves that we would cultivate, and eventually we would use as another source of biomass. Again, the idea is to have these systems commingle with the aquaculture, and actually in the UAE we have, a, or they have a, an extremely large, uh, or I guess a, a very ambitious uh, strategy for growing aquaculture, because for, for the UAE this has become a, a national security issue. There's the, most of the food, about 90% of the food in the UAE is actually imported, and so this becomes a critical situation for them. A lot of the research that we've done has been, as I said, looking into these plants and how we can use this biomass to produce different forms of energy. Turns out that uh, salicornia is very low in lignin. As I said, it's a green succulent fruit and so it has a low lignin content. So it's easier to pre-treat in the traditional lignocellulose extremes or it's easier to get to the energy in these plants. Um, it obviously lower in costs. Um, the sugar composition, the types of sugars that are in these plants are also very interesting from a chemical perspective because we've, we've been looking into um, their, their capacity for antioxidants. So not only is this a potential, there's a potential to use these types of plants for, for bioenergy per se, but also for other types of industries. We've been getting interest from the cosmetics industry, from the pharmaceutical industries, and, and, and these types of uh, elements can also be put into nutraceuticals and other types of, of, of products. Um, and of course, it can be used to produce biodiesel, bioethanol, biogas, and of course, the sustainable, or you know, in a sustainable way, the synthetic paraffinic kerosene that the aviation industry is interested in. And so this ICES concept, how do we bring it to life? What we are doing right now is that we're actually building a pilot facility it's going to be located in Mazdar City. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Mazdar City, but Mazdar City is designed to be one of the most sustainable cities in the world. The idea is, to, is for the city to produce its own energy. And so it's a place where we, we can experiment with these types of technologies. And we're going to, very soon, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start the construction of this pilot facility. This is a, 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 the basic layout of the engineering design. We engineered it in a way that we can have different combinations of, of the different variables that interact within the system. And so, as you can see here, we have six aquaculture ponds uh, plus a, an additional reservoir for water. We have eight salicornia fields, and then we have four mangrove swamps. And they're engineered in a way that mimics what happens in, in, in the tidal zones of the coastal areas. This is a, obviously a, a, what we would call a lab uh, facility. And so it's a two hectare pilot, 100 meters by 200 meters. Um, and we were, uh, our, our idea is to be able to operate the pilot for the next three to five years before moving out into a larger demonstration scale facility, a 200 hectare facility, where approximately 140 of those 200 hectares will be dedicated to Salicornia. Once we move out to that demonstration scale, we would have a proof of concept of this idea being able to move out in the, into the commercial space. And when I mention a commercial space, um, you know, a, a typical farm here in the US that produces corn or wheat or some of these products is about 20,000 hectares in size. And so more or less, uh, that's the idea for commercial scale that we're looking at. These are just a couple of renders of how it will look. The two photographs on the sides are actual, the actual plot where it will be uh, constructed. Um, and, you know, the, 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 as I mentioned, the, the idea here is to be able to produce biomass in a sustainable way. We're not falling into the debate of water use. We're not using fresh water to cultivate this biomass. We're not 
falling into the debate of land use. We're not changing the use of the land. We're, it is a, use, a change of use, but it's also a, in many, in many respects, it's a, it's an, a, it, it creates an, a, a, an ecosystem service when thinking about how it's used in combination with the aquaculture. We're not falling into this food versus fuel debate because we are actually producing food and producing energy. Um, and it's a way, uh, if anything, you know, if, this, if, this, we, if we don't produce a drop of fuel in the end, this system actually acts as, a, as an aquaculture filter. This picture on the, on the bottom right is actually a, a picture from Northwest Mexico. Uh, in, the, in the Sonoran Desert, we have these huge tracts of uh, aquaculture uh, ponds. And you can see in, in that picture the aquaculture effluent that's you know, close to the coast. And this is actually a very, a very big problem, an environmental problem for actually the, the entire region, for the, for the entire Sea of Cortez. But of course, that water comes back into the farm and this is what generates a lot of the economic losses when, when dealing with aquaculture. Just uh, to close, uh, this is the type of research that we are, we are doing at the SBRC. We're looking at how salt and water moves through a system like this. We're, we're, we're building mathematical models. We're building physical models to understand how salt deposits itself on the soil, how we can get it out, and how we can get it back into the ocean. Um, we're determining which halophytes plants are the best. Salicornia bigelovii, the plant that we're using in an initial stage, is actually a, a, a native of North America. Uh, these plants were collected mostly in, in the Gulf of Mexico, in Northwest Mexico, in the Caribbean. So Salicornia bigelovii is actually a, a native of North America. But one of the research projects that we carried out actually looked at the halophytes that grow in the UAE. And so we have a, a whole collection of, of halophytes, both annuals and perennials, that are, are already uh, classified and that, mo well, not most, but some of them have uh, very good potential to be able to produce these, these, uh, these bioenergy um, alternatives. We've also looked at, at the capacity of these halophytes to produce biogas. It turns out one of the patents that we were able to file has to do with the production of halophytes, I'm sorry, of, of biogas using these types of plants. We've, we've looked at the production of, of bioethanol with, uh, with both the salicornia and the mangrove biomass. Um, we're also looking at the different microbes that exist on the soil where the mangroves grow because this is a precursor to developing enzymes that are better able to treat or to eat or to um, uh, dissolve the biomass that, that grows. Of course, sustainability is a big aspect of this, and so we're looking at large-scale analysis or, or life cycle analysis because the idea behind these biofuels, all biofuels, is that throughout their life cycle, um, they can be better than a fossil-based alternative. Depending on how you do this, you can either be better than a fossil-based alternative or even worse, actually. There are many biofuels, and this is where a lot of the criticism has come, many biofuels that have been produced are actually twice as bad as actually using petroleum crude uh, um, uh, fuels. And finally, we're also looking at the techno-economic perspective of this because obviously this has to be a you know, if we're interested in making this at scale and making it cost effective, we actually need to understand, you know, the how, what's the commercial potential here and, and whether or not actually this can be done without, without putting any subsidies into it. And so um, these are the types of, of, of research projects that we're carrying out. And we're very excited with the construction of this new uh, pilot facility. Hopefully by the end by the end of this year, uh, early part of next year, we'll have it up and running and we'll start operating it for the next few years so that we can have a viable solution with this. And with that, I guess uh, we can take a few questions. Thank you. I think there's some microphones there if anybody's interested in asking questions. Please go ahead. <laughs> we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you for that. That was really interesting. I just had a question, um, I guess a comment about something you had said, and 
it was relating to the amount of emissions contributed by airplanes. And so I've heard that while the emissions is around 2%, um, that's actually a little misleading just because of where in the stratosphere the emissions are released. So the contribution to climate change is actually more, but I don't know if it's misleading or not, but I guess it's great that there are such ambitious goals to reduce those emissions. Great. Well, thank you. That actually leads me to a, your, one of your comments leads me to um, something that we're doing with our Eco Demonstrator program, which is a program where we test environmental technologies on a, on a flying test bed. And one of the pro projects that we're actually working on on our next Eco Demonstrator is a tool that will literally measure the emissions um, based on the strata of where it is in the atmosphere and see uh, even how the carbon emissions are being moved from area to area by the weather and what have you. So we are looking very closely at that, but um, the study was done with an average um, of the data that they had. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Alejandro. Um, with this system that you're creating, what will you do about wildlife that decides to join in the system? Actually, uh, thank you for that question. It's uh, part, of, part of the reason for creating this is that the mangroves will actually be uh, a generator uh, of wildlife. And you know, the, uh, it's actually a, a, what happens is that while the mangroves are growing, it brings in a lot of, a lot of fish, a lot of birds. Um, and so I think that, um, there's still a lot of research to be done, to be honest. Uh, and we've been talking to the people from Environment Agency Abu Dhabi. We've been talking to two different types of, of experts here. And we believe that it will uh, have a positive impact on the, on the ecosystems where these systems will grow. Um, there will be, in, a, in, 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 in honesty, a, a land use change because these desert ecosystems, it, it doesn't mean that they don't have any life in them or, or any organisms living there. Um, but one of the research projects that, that will be looked into is actually look, analyzing that effect. There's been a lot of work done by the Environment Agency in Abu Dhabi to study the Sabka soils, to study the, the, what they call the, um, the embedded carbon in these soils and the effects of actually changing uh, the use of that soil into something else. There's also an effect, an albedo effect, when you start changing the, the, the reflection patterns of these types of, of, of areas um, that uh, have been initially studied. There's a, there's a study by MIT uh, that looked into the albedo effect. And so there are many different variables that need to be considered here. Um, and so this is why we're beginning to study this uh, in, a, in a much more uh, profound way. One of the exhibitors uh, was, works in the field of eco-patents. In doing all this research, you're bound to be doing some patenting or else running into some licensing requirements. So I'm wondering, are there barriers with the current, current patent system that are hindering and should be reformed, perhaps? Or are you considering doing an eco-patent uh, program to make the technology widely available? There's bound to be, you know, disruption caused by all of this and conflicts of interest arising with different industries. Correct. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the bioenergy research is done to, at least in, in many cases, to produce patents. And these patents eventually make it out into the, the marketplace. Some of the, some of the fuels that are being used right now come from the bioenergy research that was done or has been done by the, by the Department of Energy here in the US. So a lot of those patents are finding their way into the market via either licensing schemes or via startup companies that actually go out, find venture capital, and, and start commercializing the technology. One of the interesting aspects of this is that since very little work, or almost no work, has been done in this specific space of generating biomass using salt water and desert land, the fertility, if you will, of that soil is actually very high. We're hitting into the capacity or the uh, ability to produce patents very quickly. Um, just to give you an example, the Department of Energy has, an, has 
programmed the investment of about $750 million over a period of 10 years in these three bioenergy research centers. Um, we're in about year seven of that, of that program, um, and they've produced uh, a little bit over 400 patents. Um, we've invested you know, uh, close to $2 million in our first research projects, and we're about to hit five patents. And so it's a, it's a highly um, fertile ground for, for, for generating knowledge. Um, and so we think, I mean, this is why the partners in the consortium are there. They're, they're interested in developing this knowledge and you know, potentially taking it to the commercial space. What I'm wondering about is whether there will be a sort of a monopoly on some of the key technologies or whether it will be very widely available. So I think that um, one of the biggest drivers for doing this is that, you know, when I started to work on this, I was working as uh, director of the fuel services division in Mexico for, for the agency in charge of jet fuel. And the way or, or the reason I came into contact with this particular project was because of its capacity to produce socioeconomic benefits for the communities that, le that live in these areas. This is clearly not the case in the UAE, okay? Uh, because there's not that many communities that live in these coastal areas. But it is it, a very big, um, I guess, um, possibility uh, in many different areas around the world. Uh, not least of which is, is Mexico, where we have the, the SETI people and the Yaquis that live in these areas and, and could benefit enormously by having uh, you know, the ability to cultivate this type of biomass and have a, have a way of, of working uh, uh, and producing something, something of value. And that's the same case in, in many other places around the world. And so how are we going to do that? Well, I think that the partners are looking at this obviously from a, uh, a big picture perspective in terms of producing enough biomass sustainably to have an option for current fossil-based fuels. Um, and how that will work in the different markets around the world, I think it's, it's still, still an open question. Um, but I think that we are willing to consider different schemes, such as licensing or even, you know, given the domain. technology yeah. to, yeah, put it out to, different, to different communities. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I heard you mention that um, you were looking at the soil for developing salt-tolerant enzymes. Are you primarily pursuing a biochemical approach? Or are you also exploring thermochemical conversions? OK, so the answer is both, but depending on where you are, OK? So in, in the case of the soil, there, so many of the fuels that are being produced now in these second generation fuels, some of them are going on, the, on a biochemical approach, uh, and some of them are going on a thermochemical approach. Uh, and some of them actually use both. Because once you get either the sugars or the oils from the feedstocks, you need a conversion into this, these high density uh, liquid fuels, which are basically hydrocarbons. And so these are produced using hydrogen and catalysts um, and, and, and in, a, you know, uh, in a thermochemical process. And so many of these fuels actually use both approaches to reach the final stage. Now, uh, for the feedstock part of it, it's obviously a, a, a biochemical approach mostly. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Thanks. Um, British Airways recently launched the 787 from Austin to London, and really the Dreamliner made that route happen, right? right. We could finally get over there. It was efficient enough um, to take our people to London and back. So I'm wondering, as you mentioned, um, your eco demonstrator projects. Is a route like that something that you would uh, consider to do a project, a demonstrator project on, or are those kind of separate pieces? Uh, most of our eco demonstrator flights to date, we've done one on a 737 platform, have been around the United States. Actually, our next eco demonstrator, which we'll take to the skies in the coming weeks ahead, is on a 787. 
um, platform, and it's really great to take an airplane that we've just put out into the market with the newest technology and actually go ahead and put more technology on it to see um, uh, how we can make the airplanes more efficient. Uh, so we're probably not going to be testing it. I know we're not going to test that one internationally, but it's certainly not out of the question for the future. Great. I think that's it. I want to just close with one um, statement. Uh, Alejandro started off with the, the partners in the SBRC Research Center. And I want to say there is a whole what we call the Abu Dhabi Biojet platform. And that's not only the Mazdar Institute and the Boeing company, but it's Etihad Airways. It's Total. Total is one of the largest um, uh, petroleum companies in the world. It's Takrir, which is one of the refining companies in um, Abu Dhabi or in the UAE in general. And um, what, that, what that's doing is we're taking a look and conducting basically a road mapping process to say, okay, if we can grow these plants at scale, then how do we get them into a refining space and refine them? Then how do we deal with the logistics to get them to the airport? And um, can we set a policy mechanism on top for incentives to make sure that the price is at parity with jet fuel? So we have the off taker, which would be Etihad Airways, flying on that biofuel and potentially any airline that flies into Abu Dhabi could do that as well. And really, that's just kind of like that best in, in class closed circle. And, and that's, those are the types of projects that are, end up going to be the most successful going forward, because you have to have all the stakeholders working together. You can't solve one piece of the pie without looking at all the other pieces. And so that's really one reason that I'm really excited about this project in general. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk with you today. It's been a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited about your participation in the conference. Thank you.